Well, good morning, everyone. So glad to be with you today. We're going to be in Isaiah 59. Do you ever just look around you and kind of get confused about all the evil and violence and whatever in the world and wonder, what can we do about that? Well, I do, and I know you do. And so Isaiah 59 will help us to understand uh, what our response should be to the evil that's around us. So get your Bibles. I'm going to pray, and then we'll get right to it. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day you've given us to come and study your word and have assurance from your word, which is assurance from your own heart about uh, the evil that's in our generation today. And God, may we be a part of the solution and not just be those who worry and fret about it and do nothing about it. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So in Isaiah 59, the, the background of this is very important. The nation of Israel has been really just hammered by God. They've been in, in uh, captivity, they can't get out of it, and they're loathing themselves for the mistakes that they've made. And then and, you know, God, becomes, God comes to them in uh, chapter 40 and begins to say, look, you've paid for this, this is what's going to happen. But always God is uh, truthful with us. He's truthful with us about our hearts, our lives, our actions, our sins, and he's truthful about the solutions to that. And so we're living in a day and time of chaos. Let me, let me just turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and read to you what Paul says about these days we live in. But realize this, Paul says in verse 1, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self. That's the number one and, uh, and it is, in fact, the root problem of all the chaos that we're living in today. Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unlovable, lovable, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brooders, brutal rather, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness but denying its power. Wow. That's where we're living today. But the first thing Paul says was that people would be lovers of self. Self directs us to all our sins in our lives. And so God, through the prophet Isaiah, comes to the children of Israel and he says, look, uh, it's important for you to understand a few things. Understand the nature of the chaos. Uh, understand how uh, current problems uh, are not adequately addressed with laws and whatever else and what the only solution it is, is. And notice in verse one of chapter 59, the, behold, the hand of the Lord is not so short that it cannot save, neither is his ear so dull, he's not deaf, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and listen to this, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. What's the problem of the chaos in the world that we're living in? Sin. Sin dulls the ear of God, shortens the hand of God, and he, he, he will not save us. He will not correct anything until sin is dealt with. You, you know, uh, we have so much chaos and anger. I, I think we're living in a gotcha world. It's irreconcilable. You, you know, we, we want you to sin. We encourage you to sin, to be sexually aberrant, be drunk, and whatever else. And when you do, we've got you, and then we're going to punish you to the full extent of the law. Or people are angry today, and they go and they, they, we have mass shootings in America. And people say, well, we need more laws, and we need to take guns away. That's not going to take care of anger. That's not going to take care of despair. That, that's not going to take care of people doing brutal things to other people. That will never stop. Another law will never, ever stop abuse in the home. It will not stop bullying at school. These are selfish things that cause sin to arise. And every time sin arises in my life, if I'm in a relationship with anybody else, it affects that person negatively. Gossip, being malicious, wounding people, physically harming people, always ruins and wounds somebody else. And you can pass all the laws you want to and have all the self-help programs you want to, and it will not stop a heart that is bent on rebelling against God. And Isaiah comes to say, look, you need to understand that as long as your sins are, are not dealt with, as long as your life doesn't change, 
there's really no hope for you to overcome the chaos in your own life, much less help anybody else in this world overcome their chaos. So we're going to continue to have violence and, and confusion and depression and despair and all of this. That's truly the issue today. And what can we do to get out of that for ourselves? And what can we do to help others get out of that? You know, it doesn't take much to change the attitude and the view of a population. And if believers like you and me got really serious about living our faith and sharing our faith, multitudes of people would come to Christ and that would begin a whole movement, a whole reviving, a whole change of, of the nature of, of the violence and the confusion and the chaos that's going on right now. And I'm not sure many people believe that, even people who claim to be Christian and claim to believe the Bible. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Until sins are taken care of, what I just read to you in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is going to be the pattern of every society and every life. And, and sometimes I think people think, well, the, the only option that we have is maybe almost like a dictatorship where rights are taken away from people and the thumb is put down on people. Is that the way you want to live? Do you think that's really the answer? Do you think that, that causes people to be less depressed or less violent or less drunk or less addicted? Do you, think, do you really believe that? If we really believe the Bible, then we would really and truly understand that God and God alone is to have the solution for us. It's not that he can't save, but he can't save those who persist in their sin, believing that they can be selfish, believing that they can be uh, uh, sinful, believing they can be immoral, all of these kind of things. Until God changes the heart of a person, he can't change the heart of a family or a, or a community or a nation. He can't do it. He wants to change the world by us living our lives and sharing this gospel that only Jesus can save us from ourselves. Only Jesus can save us from ourselves. I heard a preacher say one time, we're trying to escape all the pressure we're under. We're trying to escape, and so we go off on these vacations, he said. Uh, and he said, the problem with going on a vacation is that you have to take yourself with you, and nothing changes. You come back, and because you didn't change anything, you just caught a breath to come back into your own chaos. Well, what does God say about this? Listen to what he says in verses 3 and following. He says, Your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken falsehood, and your tongue mutters wickedness. When people in our generation continue to say, good is bad and bad is good, when we continue to abort unborn children, when we continue to shoot up people in parking lots and, and post offices and schools, when we continue to do that, and think that we can somehow find a solution in and of ourselves, we are fools. He says, you continue to do this. Your hands are defiled with blood. He says, uh, they go on, he said, no one sues righteously. In other words, no one per, uh, pursues to be righteous. No one pleads honestly. They trust in confusion and speak lies. You, you can't trust much of what anybody says anymore. Our elected officials are known, and we just let them continue to do that. We continue to elect them to office uh, to, to, to feed their greed, perhaps, or, and they lie, and, and people lie to one another. You, you know, when I tell a lie, have you ever thought about this? If I tell a lie to you, the first, that's the second lie. The first lie is the lie I tell to myself. That by telling you a lie, I can get out of it, or you can respect me more, or whatever else. That's the first lie. And then I speak that lie, and you hear it, and I've wounded you for it. That's what he's talking about here. They trust in confusion and speak lies. Verse 4, they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. The whole pornographic industry is like that. The whole sex slave industry is like that. This whole thing about uh, confusion about gender and whatever, that's what this is. That's all a lie. You're causing people to pretend there's something that God had never ordained for their lives. And it brings harmful confusion to their lives. It brings mental illness to their lives. There's nothing good that will ever come out of that. The first lie you ever tell is to yourself. To say, this is all right. This is the way I'm going to do. The second lie is, well, God won't mind or others won't mind. or whatever. Nobody else will be affected by this. Living a lie. You can't get close to the Lord when you're living a lie. 
And he goes on to say in verse 6, their webs will not become clothing. In other words, it's not going to be successful. The more we lie, the more we kill, the more we do all these things and pursue this selfish path of life that Americans especially and people in the Western world are, are so much encouraged to do, nothing is going to ever, you can't build a life on that kind of life. You can't build a life on a lie. You can't build a life on sin. You can't build a life on confusion and anger. You can't build a life on chaos. You can't build a nation on chaos. That's not the answer. It will never, ever work. He says their web will not become clothing. And he said, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and an act of violence is in their hands. You, you can't live in a more violent world than we're living in right now. We have religious violence. We have political violence. We have emotional violence. We have violence from mental illness. We have violence generated out of anger and selfishness. And people are so frustrated, they don't know what to do. Well, to continue to do what we've been doing doesn't seem to be the answer. He said their feet run, e run to evil and they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are of iniquity and devastation and destruction are in their highways. The road their own destroys. Don't live like that and don't encourage anybody to live like that. Don't condone what God condemns. Don't, don't ever pass light judgment over what God will bring judgment upon. And he says, they don't know the way of peace. How can you know the way of peace when you have chaos and anger and bitterness in your life? There is no peace in that. And he says, there's no justice in their tracks. We call for justice and social justice and whatever else, and it doesn't do any good to march and talk about that. That doesn't change anything. In fact, it further divides people. You want to bring justice in this world? We bring Jesus Christ, the just one. You bring righteousness into a life and justice will be established. You bring righteousness into a life, and that leader who is righteous will bring righteousness to everything he leads. You, you bring righteousness to a home, and everybody's life gets better. When the righteous do well, the Proverbs say, the city rejoices. That's how we change the world. And we are responsible for that, folks. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are responsible for that. They don't know the way of justice, verse 8. There is no justice in their tracks. They've made pa their paths crooked. Whoever treads on them does not know peace. He's talking about their influence, influencing people even to do the same. So that's the question. That's the issue. What are we going to do about it? Pass more laws? How many laws do we need that are ineffective? Uh, that, uh, passing a law doesn't make me uh, right. It, it makes me a lawbreaker. Uh, you know, 70 mile an hour on the interstate, let's drive 80. Uh, you know, don't, don't stop, at a, uh, stop at this uh, intersection, let's just coast through the stop sign. That's just who we are. We don't want anybody telling us what to do or any authority over our lives. And until God changes our hearts, then nothing is going to happen. So what's the solution that are being offered today? More laws? I've already talked about that. How about unlimited freedom? If I have unlimited freedom, then that means I think I have the freedom to absolutely ruin your life or hurt your life or use you up for my benefit. And we see this in marriage that is, marriage that's, uh, marriages that are failing. We see it in families that are failing. We see it in corporations that are failing, schools that are failing. Every institution of mankind is failing because people want this unlimited freedom to satisfy their selfish longings. And all it does is bring destruction and misery and poverty and injustice to and in their lives. Well, there's even failed religion. You would think that religion would get people out of themselves. But we have religion today that's consumeristic. You know, I come and I sit and I soak and I demand that somebody speak to me what I want to hear. Paul says in the last days, people will want their ears tickled and they'll get people to tickle their ears. We don't want to hear the truth because the truth at first is so painful and it's so illuminating. It shows us who we are. But you know, you got to get to the bad news before you can get to the good news. And so uh, religion that brings no change of heart is no good. Laws that bring no change of heart, those laws are no good. 
you, you know, following our own path and our own way, that really doesn't bring a change of heart. These things are no good because they don't have any power to change. You see, if I tell you what you're doing is wrong, even if you agree with me, the question is, do you have the power to change? Well, you might make incremental change, but until your heart is transformed and your life is transformed, all you're doing and all I'm doing is avoiding the truth. And as long as I avoid the truth, I'm going to pay the consequences. That's the game, isn't it? Truth or consequences? Truth or consequences? If I lie, I take the consequences. If I tell the truth and live the truth, the consequences are great. I have a good life. I have a good heart. I begin to understand who I am and accept who I am as God made me. And I begin to live out that identity in my life. But until that happens, all I have is chaos and uncertainty. I can never be secure in this world. I can never be secure in my own skin. I'm pretending to be something that I can never, ever be. I'm pretending to be happy and fulfilled. And it's just a lie. And so we're separated from God. Our sins cause this. And as long as I live in that chaos, it's not that God doesn't want to help me. But until I deal with the real me, then nothing good is going to happen. The only answer comes in a person. And it comes from God. And it comes in the person of Jesus Christ who came to earth to show God's love and nature and to give us by his death, burial, and resurrection, give us with the coming of the Holy Spirit the power to have a transformed life, to transform our lives and our hearts. Instead of living for ourselves, we live for the glory of God and the benefit of other people. And all of a sudden we're humans who produce the change that is necessary in life. There is no limit to what your life and my life can affect. When God gets a hold of us and salvation comes to us in Jesus Christ, there is, listen, there is no limit to what God can do through our lives to affect the lives of others. How can we as Christians stand by and watch our world degenerate into the chaos it is and never witness and never live for Christ and never be separate and holy? Listen to what Isaiah says in chapter 59. Because justice had been turned back and there's no hope. Uh, in verse 11, I love what he says. We growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. It's not going to be in the next person we elect. It's not going to be in the next degree that we get. It's not going to be in the next home that we buy. It's got to come from outside of ourselves. For our transgressions are multiplied before you. Isaiah says, our sins testify against us, not for us. And he says, transgression, verse 13, transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. And justice is turned back. Righteousness is made to stand far away. For the truth has stumbled in the street. But listen to this. And he saw this is so important. Verse 16, God looked down and he saw that there was no man. And he was astonished that there was no one to intercede. You look all over humanity and nobody can pull us out of this mess. There are good people trying to do good things. And incrementally they're accomplishing a few good things. But it's not enough. And it's, Isaiah said, the Lord looked down and looked at uh, the earth and looked at the chaos on the earth and found out that there was nobody that could intercede between God and man for the sins of mankind. Watch what he did. He says, Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. In other words, he did something. The right arm of God is the strength of God. When man could not do it, he sent one to be like us, the God-man, in order to do it. And he says, And he put on righteousness like a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head and he put on a garment of vengeance for clothing and he wrapped himself with zeal like a mantle he came in to judge the world of its unrighteousness and to save the world from it isn't that wonderful god's love also carries with it god's justice 
God's justice calls us into accountability for our sins. And the only thing we can do is agree with God. That's called confessing our sins. And when we confess our sins, then we come to the Lord for the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. And he makes all these wrongs right. He brings calm to chaos. Think about that. He brings righteousness to unrighteousness. He brings forgiveness to sin. He brings new life to those of us who are dead in our trespasses and sins. He will repay our sins. That's what it says in verses 18 and 19. But listen to what it says in verse 20. I love this. And a redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. Now we extend that into modern times. It goes far beyond Israel. The redeemer has come. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ has come. And he's come to redeem us from our sins. What we could not do for ourselves enslaved to sin, dominated by the devil, Jesus comes to break the bonds of sin, break the back of the devil, broke his neck in victory and resurrection so that we can find new life. If anyone is in Christ, the Bible says, that person is a new creation, a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And listen to what verse 21 says. As for me, this is my covenant with them. This is God speaking to you and me. Says the Lord, my spirit which is upon you, my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. He said, I'm going to send Jesus, and he's going to correct all that's wrong in this world. And we are his instruments. We receive the illumination in salvation, and we become lights into this world. There are two things. Number one, don't despair. God is moving in this world. And then be used by God to be a point of light to bring people into the light. How wonderful that is that God has sent a redeemer to Zion, a redeemer to America, a redeemer to this world to save us from our sins, to establish justice, to establish peace, to de destroy chaos and sin and waywardness and decline and degeneration. He gives us his righteousness and out of that flows the living water that we can give to other people, giving to them what we have found. Don't despair, but be used of God to change our world. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that this message be driven deep into our hearts and spur us to the action to take your gospel, your Jesus, our Savior and Messiah, to the people in this world so that they might have salvation and be delivered from all that's plaguing them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, it's been wonderful to be with you. I look forward to being with you next week as we continue to look at the impact that Jesus makes in our lives, for our lives, and then through our lives. Until next week, God bless you.